Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending the uh, May 11th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting in this very unconventional setting. We are holding this meeting virtually with the Planning Commission members and staff not present together in the meeting room so that we can meet the legal requirements of the meeting and help ensure the health and safety of all involved. Before we begin, I'll introduce members and explain the procedure. Mr. Bill Thurman represents the Valley District. Mr. Steve Kidd represents the Buckhannon District. Mr. Brandon Knightley represents the Bencastle District. Mr. Sam Foster represents the Blue Ridge District. Mr. Ray Sloan is their official member and he represents the Buckhannon District. Mr. Chris Daddick, the County Attorney. Mr. Nicole Pendleton, Director of Community Development. Mr. Drew Pearson, Senior Planner. Mr. Peter Bullison, Planner. Laura Bowie, Administrative Assistant. And I'm Harold Alpha Knightley, Chairman, and I represent the Amsterdam District. To expedite business, the Planning Commission has established the following procedures. Staff will read the agenda items and make presentations. Then the applicant or their representative may make their presentation. Presentations may be made remotely due to the COVID-19. There may be questions and comments from the planning commission. Afterwards, citizens' comments will be taken. After that, we will bring the applicant or their representative back to address any concerns. The public hearing will then be closed and we will discuss the matter amongst ourselves and vote on that particular agenda item. The Planning Commission will make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors who will make the final decision on rezoning, change of conditions, text amendments, and special exception permit requests. The Board of Supervisors will go here the text amendment for cluster development Tuesday, May 26, 2020 at 3.30 p.m here at the Greenfield Education Training Center. The other item will be heard on Tuesday, May 26, at 6 p.m. here at the Greenfield Training Center. The Planning Commission will meet in the Kroger parking lot for a field review on Thursday, June 4, 2020, at 3.15. Now we will consider a review approval of the April 13, 2020 Planning Commission meeting minutes. Do I have a motion to approve this minute? Second. I have a motion. Is there a second? No, second. Any questions, discussion, or minutes? Hearing none, those minutes will stand approved as presented. So you are attending in person or calling in. I know that this is something different for all of us. We greatly appreciate your flexibility and patience as we seek to receive comments during the public comment period and public hearing. This planning commission meeting is being conducted pursuant to and in compliance with the emergency ordinance to fulfill temporary changes in certain deadlines and to modify public meeting and public hearing practices and procedures to address continuity of operations associated with the pandemic disaster. Now, before we get started with the meeting, I want to review the process we will use. The full agenda package is posted on the Planning Commission's website for review and following along. If you go to the Bodegat County homepage and visit your government menu, you can then click on the Planning Commission website for the agenda. For the public comment period and each of the public hearings today, I will take comments from those present at Greenfield first. Citizens here at Greenfield that are interested in speaking should go down to the podium on the upper level, on the upper floor, to await their turn to speak. After those present have spoken, we will receive comments from those of you who are listening on the phone. I will provide exact instructions during each hearing for making comments. 
If for some reason the virtual meeting system fails during the meeting, we will work to reboot and get back online in the next 15 to 30 minutes. The phone number and code will not change and can be dialed into at any time. Are there any questions or comments from the planning commission members? Mr. Drew Harrison will give a presentation on text amendment requests regarding cluster development. And we will now open the public hearing. Nice. Yes, he will give that presentation. I'm a little scared about that.
uh, were to develop under the standard A1 type zoning. The density from a number of lot perspectives shouldn't change very much at all. Increase the maximum lot coverage of cluster lots from 20 to 50 percent and the con uh, conservation lot from 5 to 20 percent. And to increase the number of conservation lots that may be served by private access from the already two to five lots with an increased easement width, depending on how many lots would be served off of the easement. To reduce the minimum lot width from 100 to 70 feet. And also to provide for the uh, preservation of open space through the creation of a conservation lot, open space home, and maintained by the public entity or a homeowner association. Also involved uh, section 25-75B with building requirements, um, which reads cluster A1 development option. And there we would reduce the minimum front yard for a cluster lot from 35 to 25 feet, reduce the minimum side yard for cluster lot from 15 to 10 feet, and correct uh, an error to add the word accessory building to the minimum yard requirements to clean up. And section 25 is the water and wastewater service. Uh, there's another update uh, to change the work from county to Western Virginia Water Authority since uh, the county system uh, is not handled by them. So in the R1 district, and these are the two districts that, that have the cluster language. So in the R1 district, section 124B, and the, the cluster R1 development option, um, it, we're proposing to reduce the minimum lot area from 12,000 to 8,000 square feet to increase the maximum lot coverage of the cluster lot from 20 to 50% and the conservation lot from 5 to 20%, which is probably recognized as consistent from a coverage standpoint with the other A1 standard. Increase the number of conservation lots that we can put by the public access movement to that are already allowed by the decreased movement. Create some level of consistency uh, between the two districts in, when the cluster option is, is utilized. And reduce the minimum lot width from 80 to 60 feet. Reduce the minimum open space of the parent track from 50 to 25%. And then in section 25-125C, the building requirements reduce the minimum yard for cluster lot from 25 to 15 feet, but only when there's drive access uh, provided by a secretary private outlet. And then under section 25-426, youth limitation, again, to change the, the work term work in some county to the to the water authority. So uh, again, these were standards and suggestions that we came up with uh, from staff working with the development community as well as some local design professionals and really looking at a way to take what uh, is in our ordinance that the cluster option is already there in most of those districts but has never really been utilized uh, to try to make it more functional so that it could be utilized. So at this time, um, you are being requested to recommend either approval, recommend approval of changes, or recommend the final of the proposed text amendment. Uh, as of the meeting, staff hasn't received any public feedback concerning the request. I do believe that online tonight, uh, we probably do have um, one of the local developers as well as one of the design professionals that, that are listening in and, and they may have something uh, that they would want to add, but they would also, I'm sure, be happy to answer the question if, if you have them. And at this time, I'll be happy to entertain your questions. Very good. Thank you. Anyone have any questions before we open the public hearing? Drew, hey, uh, this is Sam. Yes. Under uh, A1, the uh, conservation lots from 25 to 3 acres. And it was 25 acres? Previously it was 25. We, we had a, a, an occasion which really prompted the, uh, 
the resolution by the board, uh, we were looking at a Greenway Trail project, and, and we were, the county was speaking with and uh, looking at the, a particular piece of property where that Green Trailway Trail will go. Um, the, the property owner was, of course, concerned if he uh, gave up some land area, you know, how that would impact the developability of the property. And at that time, we had started looking at the standard ordinance as a current bar. And, and, and when we really got to diving into that, that's the reason why we believe that we've never really had anybody utilize that option as it was intended, where we kind of clustered the lot to not really putting in uh, any more density on the property than what you would otherwise. But, but really, the standards were such that it made it overly restricted. And, and in, in a lot of cases, they would probably not even be able to get as much density under the cluster option as they could have if they just developed it regularly. Um, so that was really some of the results. So you'll see some significant changes when it comes to, to some of these kind of things. Um, keeping in mind that sometimes you might have open space that helps to keep that density down. Other times you might have a developer that doesn't really want to create the open space areas and they might do the larger conservation lots. Well, the lots are still going to be big, but they're going to be individually owned and can't be further subdivided. So that your density at the end of the day is really not very much different at all. It's very close to the same density. The only thing in the standards that should actually change that a little bit would be the, uh, the when you have water and sewer available to the one, which isn't going to be that often, uh, and it allows that density to be based on an acre and a half lot wide versus the two and a quarter acre that they currently would be. So it's a big thing, but it shouldn't really change the that much at all. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Anybody else? If not, we'll uh, open the public hearing. And uh, of course, we have uh, comments from anyone that's uh, present here at the Greenfield Center uh, to speak to this. And if they are, they need to uh, go to the podium and have three minutes to speak. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to press control to the auditorium in a second, please hold. Auditorium, you're Planning Commission, I would like to make sure that you can hear so that the citizens may address the panel and, and hopefully they can be heard. Can you verify that you can hear me clearly? Does everybody hear well? Yeah. 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 Steve? Good. Yeah. All right, we, we can we can hear. Do you have anyone to speak to this issue? Uh, does anybody, anybody wish to speak to this issue? If you do, please come down. Do you wish to speak on this issue? If anybody would like to speak on this issue, could could you please come down here? On the which which issue talking about? The one he was speaking about just now. Cluster development. Did they hear that? Cluster development. Cluster development. Do we have anyone at the podium to speak? At this time, no, sir. If there are no comments uh, from anyone here, is there anyone on the line that would like to speak to this?
Again, this is a public hearing on clusters. Mr. Chairman, hearing no one speaking to that. We'll close the public hearing. And discuss this issue among ourselves. I think we've uh, done a good job of presenting the, the changes before our commission. Uh, any comments from any of you? Sam? No, I'm okay. Okay. Hello. Good. All right, do I have a motion to move forward with this? Chairman, I make a motion. I move that the text amendments to Chapter 25, Article 2, District Regulations Generally and Regulations, and as included in this memo, be forwarded to the Board of Supervisors with the recommendation of approval. This recommendation is made on the basis that the requirements of Section 25581.1 of the Zoning Arts have been satisfied and the proposal will serve. Public necessity, convenience, general welfare, and is a good discussion practice. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes, second. Second. Any questions or discussion? Call roll, please. Mr. Knight, please. Mr. Hyman, please. Yes. Mr. Foster. Yes. Mr. Randy Knight, please? Yes. Mr. Kidd? Yes. Mr. Thurman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on along, Mr. McCulkin will give a presentation on text amendment request regarding utility scale with energy. Nicole will mention that the report prepared by staff contains two public hearing items, but that they should be considered separately. Ms. Thank you. And um, Mr. Pearson, if you can pull up the presentation or we need to transition that. Mr. I am. I'm transitioning right now. development 
that has greater impact than uses permitted by right. The ordinance provides for general standards that must be met by every project. It also, also authorizes the board to impose other requirements that provide for specific considerations based on the individualized components of each project. With the adoption of that ordinance, one general standard that exists for every potential project is a maximum height limitation of 550 feet. On October 31st, 2019, Apex Clean Energy and Jerry Fraley, property owner, filed a petition with the Board of Supervisors asking it to initiate action to amend the general performance standards in the county's ordinance. Their petition letter states that wind energy technology, equipment, and efficiencies have changed since the Rocky Ford SEP was approved in January 2016. The request involves three components of the ordinance. The maximum total height of the turbine, the maximum height of substations and points of interconnection, and the period of validity. On December 19, 2019, staff presented a petition as presented by APEX to the Board of Supervisors. After public input and some discussion, the Board directed staff to explore all components of the ordinance and defer a separate but related action to procure an independent consultant to review the view the SEP application. In order to provide an opportunity for the public to offer comments on the existing ordinance and provide recommendations, staff held a community meeting on February 10th to gather feedback on the existing ordinance at Eagle Rock Elementary School. Approximately 45 people attended the meeting. Staff also utilized an online survey form to see feedback, gathering 95 responses between February 6th and the 23rd. In addition, staff has also captured feedback from phone calls, emails, and other written correspondence related to these amendments, as well as the application for a change of condition to the previously granted SEP. At the February 25th board meeting and the March 9th planning commission meeting, staff presented the results of the survey, survey and feedback received to date. This was informational and no action was taken on the text amendment, as they were still under review by staff. After reviewing public comments, other ordinances and survey results, staff proposed draft amendments. Next slide, please. that were provided in your report. They are a reflection of the applicant's request, but they are not an endorsement by staff of the maximum height currently being requested by the applicant. The planning commission today is being requested to make a decision on the amendment. They may choose to recommend the amendments as written. They may make a recommendation for approval with the changes that be appropriate to meet the purpose and the intent of the ordinance or they may make a recommendation of denial to the board. Next slide, please. The components of the ordinance changes are as follows. A change of the maximum permitted height from 550 to 680 feet is measured from the ground to the highest vertical portion of the blade when fully extended. The addition of a section related to maximum height for substations and facilities for points of interconnection Equipment and structures for substations and facilities may not exceed 100 feet. And third, the deletion of a section related specifically to the expiration of a utility scale wind energy special exception permit is not installed and functioning within five years. The rationale for the period of validity is that there is another component of the zoning ordinance which regulates federal exception permits as provided to us and able by the state of Virginia through the state code. And it states, unless a longer period of validity is specifically approved, no special exception permit shall be valid for a period longer than five years from the date on which it was granted, unless a building permit is obtained and the erection or alteration of the structure is started and diligently pursued an occupancy permit is obtained in a use commence or the issuance of the zoning permit. Such period of validity may be extended for good cause shown by application to the Board of Supervisors. 
As a condition of approval, a special exception permit may be granted for a specific period of time less than five years with the expiration of the approval to occur at the termination of said period. And this section of the zoning ordinance provides a period of validity for all special exception permits and may be shortened as a condition of approval should the board wish to impose a condition related to the expiration of an SCP. Staff does recommend the deletion of this section in order to avoid conflicts with the code. Next slide. Mr. Taylor, we just lost um, video. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, today, as of Sunday at 6 44 p.m., in terms of the text amendment um, recommendation, as you know, we have instituted a new procedure to comply with and um, encourage the opportunity for people to provide their comments to us in advance of the meeting. That we had 16 comments that were in support of the ordinance changes and 23 in opposition. And that those numbers have changed. Um, obviously, we have had an influx of uh, public comments that have come in since that point. So we processed those and shared those with the Planning Commission. And we'll continue to do that with the Board of Supervisors. So that those numbers are, are not an accurate reflection of uh, we even have been having comments coming in during the meeting. So, um, we'll be providing an update of those numbers um, to the board supervisors at that appropriate time. Mr. Pearson, is there one more slide potentially? I'm not sure. Thank you. So uh, at this point in time, I believe that will conclude my presentation of the recommendations of the ordinance amendment. And what I'm happy to do is answer any questions the planning commission might have for me at this time. Thank you. Gentlemen, questions? Sure enough. Well, yeah. If, Ms. Bennett, is there any way we can extend them? I, I kind of missed that part a little bit. I'd rather say extended than deleted. Uh, I know it's maybe a uh, an issue with the zoning ordinance. Mr. Dyke, if I understand you correctly, your question is about the deletion of that particular section? Yeah. Certainly. So the way that the ordinance for all SCPs currently is written is that if um, it, it basically still holds true. So if no um, amendments to the special exception permit were filed, if no building permit were obtained or no site plan application was filed, then it would, in five years um, from the date of the SCP, if this one were denied, would expire. If the particular changes and conditions of the new SCP were considered, then in five years, if no action were taken, it would expire. So there's Okay, so they have approximately, what would be the expiration date now? It would be January of 2021, if they did not file it. If they, if they filed a site plan application, then according to the other section of the code, then the, um, they would not lose their period of validity. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Hearing none, we'll move to the public hearing. Uh, as 
mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, the first comments will come from those who are here at the Greenfield Center. Uh, the first speaker would go to the podium. You have three minutes to speak. One, one point I'd like to make is please don't be redundant and repeat something that's already been said uh, in order that we get to hear everybody that wants to speak. So if someone has said something that you wanted to say before you, uh, we'll take that as good. So uh, if the first speaker would go to the buddy. It's Chairman Harvey to pass control now to Young Twain, please hold. Please. Young Twain, you can hear me okay now? Yeah. Yes, um, please state your name and address. I'm Eric Clonch, living at 2817 Mount Moriah Road, Eagle Rock. Members of the Planning Commission, in the Board of Supervisors meeting minutes from 23 February 2016, complete package, page 34, I paraphrase, the Board of Supervisors approved a special exception permit to construct a wind energy system with 17 conditions as attached, and that the proposal would serve the public necessity, convenience, and general welfare, and is good zoning practice. These 17 conditions are described in the same Board of Supervisors record, pages 50 to 55, where it also states, these conditions are binding. I discovered these in March this year. Although required conditions for project approval, they were nowhere accessible on the county's website, only buried in the Board of Supervisors record cited until last month. These 17 conditions are still missing from the Planning and Zoning Division's Wind Energy webpage. In fact, the Wind Energy webpage has no new content since June 2015. One might suspect the county is intentionally trying to hide something. So after stumbling on these 17 required conditions, I've reviewed them and found several not yet satisfied. There is no operations and maintenance plan, only an O&M plan section, summarizing general concepts with words such as should, typically done, there will likely be. This is not even an executive summary of a plan. The county states seven explicit subcategories within the plan that must be satisfied. None has been to date. There is no emergency response plan, there's no construction traffic management plan. There is a subheading called construction management plan in the statement of intent file, but it is only four paragraphs with no discussion of how traffic will be managed. Hello? Apex has had four years to draft and refine these plans. They haven't even written them, and now they want more time? Ladies and gentlemen, it appears the county neglected oversight of these 17 required conditions until I recently rediscovered them. Apex's attempt to get by without even showing progress toward every required SEP condition reinforces their bad faith and lack of professionalism. Planning Division members, I urge you to reject Apex's request to delete the five-year time limit and send Apex packing. This project does not serve the public necessity and is most assuredly not good zoning practice. And I would add, there is no conflict with the code if the expiration remains. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Next speaker. Good evening, gentlemen, ladies, and gentlemen. Uh, I'm uh, Bill Van Velzer, 393 Cox Road, Tropical, Virginia. Uh, yeah, what Eric said. I think he made some very valid uh, points. Uh, I am concerned about the general attitude um, 
taken by the Planning Commission and the previous Board of Supervisors regarding the wisdom of uh, allowing Rocky Forge to, um, to be completed in Montauk County. Um, I suspect everyone here already knows where I stand with Rocky Forge. In 2015 until now, I could have simply remained silent about this threat to a county that has no experience with the ramifications of bringing industrial scale wind turbines here. Instead, I chose to speak out because this is my home too. It's not easy to fully articulate in short sound bites the breadth and depth of my experiences with wind turbine development in Southern California beginning, beginning in the 1980s and what it's done there. My family and I and our neighbors have lived it. We lost and now Botetourt County may be on the verge of losing too. I don't want this to happen here. I'm opposed to all three revisions to the Wind Energy Systems Ordinance, and Tari says, as a matter of fact, that the 680 feet are taller than the average turbine height nationally and worldwide. Furthermore, I oppose any, del any uh, deletion of the five-year uh, limit on the expiration of an SEP because it simply incentivizes a bait and switch, which we've already seen and we're in the midst of right now. Furthermore, after viewing the Rocky Forge Visit YouTube video via the Planning Commission site, I see this, a video with upbeat music inviting enthusiasm about building a now undetermined number of 680 foot tall turbines in a wilderness area. A fabulous view from 600 feet, which also reveals how far away these turbines will be seen by others. A genuine celebration of the fact that 680 foot tall turbines will be hoisted atop not one ridge line, but two. Seems a little biased to me. When viewing the number of pros and cons, furthermore, on the Botetourt County Planning website, keep in mind that we don't know how many pro comments are the result of membership in good neighbor agreements, where those who sign on the dotted line are required to act as agents of a wind turbine project. We will never know this because good neighbor agreements are by their very nature secret and become null and void when participants reveal membership in one. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the three minutes is up. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Matt Cooper. I live at 402 Timber Ridge, Fincastle, Virginia. Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. You have heard and will hear a lot of negative propaganda requesting that you not recommend to the Board of Supervisors to amend the proposed text amendments. Several people pushing that propaganda are not even from Botetourt County. The previously mentioned 17 items that were required by Mr. Clonch, if I'm not mistaken, do not happen until the site plan review anyway. As a member of the Fraley family and a Resident of the Finn Castle District, I'm asking you to recommend to the Board of Supervisors that they approve the proposed text amendments to the wind energy systems in the zoning ordinance. I also request that you recommend to the Board of Supervisors to approve the change of conditions to a previously approved special exemptions permit concerning the project. If approved, the amended text amendments and the change of conditions to the SCP will be a very positive step for Bottle County. Thank you. Thank you, Brady Connor. Next, please. Good afternoon. I'm William Solo. I live at 2207 Old Fincastle Road in Fincastle. 
Um, a deadline is not really a deadline if it has no integrity. You know, if uh, somebody's here speaking and they go past their three minutes, they're gone. These people have been waiting around for five years. I'd like to take this time to read the comment that I spent to the Planning Commission today. I would like to go on record as strongly opposing the wind project. There are many reasons for this, but frankly, I am surprised that Botetourt County is even taking Apex so seriously. Even a casual search shows that Apex is an irresponsible corporate citizen that has manipulated one community after another. They have objectively lied on many important points, even going so far as to have one of their executives pose as a military hero in order to smooth over a deal to put a wind farm near the Niagara Falls Air Force Reserve Station. This was reported in the Union Sun and Journal, September 26, 2018. Their patterns of behavior are so predictable that Bonita should not waste any more time and resources entertaining them. Once Apex gets paid, the communities that they do business with are left holding a bag of empty promises and legal problems. There is ample evidence that Apex has, had, has lied to one planning commission after another. What makes you think that you are so different? They will lie to you too. Apex has no offices in Botetourt County. There's no one here to be held accountable once the project tanks. More importantly, there are no legal mechanisms in place that can keep Apex honest. The state won't lift a finger because everyone knows that this wind farm is a pet project of Ralph Northland. Other communities have been wrong, that have been wronged by Apex, and there are many, have to resort to expensive lawsuits and legalistic maneuvers in an attempt to be made whole again. Yet no lawsuit or legal settlement can replace the natural landscape that we already have from God. Ultimately, this is not a discussion about a wind farm, but rather a discussion about a corporation that has manipulated small communities in order to enrich themselves at the expense of the taxpayer. Botetourt County deserves better than what Apex is offering. I ask that you reject any further applications from Apex and send the message that they will not be allowed to scam the citizens of Botetourt. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, my name is John Cooper. I live at 535 Hollymead Lane, Daleville. I'm a husband, father, business owner, entrepreneur, and a member of the Fraley family. Botetourt County is a tremendous resource at its disposal in Rocky Forge. As a business owner and leader, I'm tasked with finding new revenue streams to flow into my business to fund future growth opportunities and expansion. This is the perfect project for Botetourt County. You all have seen our family's property. It's 10,000 acres in the middle of nowhere. Closest landowner to any of the proposed tower locations is Mr. Henry Gum, over 1.3 miles away, and he said on the record multiple times, you can put one of those things up in my front yard. In fact, support, like Mr. Gum for this project, has outnumbered the opposition since the genesis of the project. This project's a win-win for Botetourt. Millions of dollars have already been invested and injected into this project. Botetourt County is set to receive over 16 million despite no upfront capital investment. All it takes Botetourt County is a little bit of due diligence, getting educated on the industry, and a whole lot of common sense. If Apex is installing a project of this nature in our county, it should have the latest technology which will allow for taller turbines with a less number of turbines. I'm the next generation owner of North Mountain on this parcel. And I can assure you that our family has always been and will always be committed to conservation. Wildlife habitat that you see on North Mountain right now is good, but in the future, even after turbine installation, it will thrive. We just visited Beach Ridge in West Virginia and would you know that there were animals around the turbines? Deer, bear. I'm asking you to approve this vote and recommend the project to the Board of Supervisors. Let's make history as the first wind farm in the state of Virginia. I truly believe you all want to make the best decisions for our county. And in my humble opinion, approving this project is a no-brainer. Thank you for your comments. Uh, my name is Bob Hunley. I live on 805 Berman Road, Iraq. 
I believe the turbine will present a danger to the Tri-County area. Because the fog fire burns awful fast up a mountain, and when it gets to the top of the mountain, all that gas and heat ignites into an explosion. This is called a crown fire. One occurred on Chips Mountain back in 1970 and took the life of a big island fell, fell, fella. Now, uh, these things, in explosion, it would throw, I suppose, greasy embers up into the air. And in the wind, as tall as these things are, the upper wind current could carry them a long way to fall down into watersheds that are full of dead ash trees that have died over the last five, six years due to this uh, ash bowl. Now, ash tree got its name because it burns so hot, all you got left is white ash. Now, uh, California went to wind energy a few decades ago. Look the fix they in. I mean, if California mountaintop wind turbine was a factor in all those fire disasters, last one's going to tell you is a power monopoly that had them put up there. And they had a town named, a California town named Paradise. Must have been a nice place. Now, I suppose uh, with all the elimination of all those California middle class rural homes, California mountain land ought to be a lot cheaper and more available. Cause fire been used as a social engineering tool throughout this country's history. And last I want to say is back in the mid 1700s, a British philosophical professor named Adam Smith predicted that the British Empire would lose their American colonies because the British Parliament allowed British merchants pursuit of profit to overcome prudence. And you got to wreck two clean creeks, Mill Creek and Sinkin Creek, flows out of that mountain, southern end of that mountain. And I drink out of Second Creek every day. You don't want to take a chance on compromising a natural gift like that. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you for your comments. Hello, my name is Melissa Hunley, and I reside at 422 East Ridgeway Street in Clifton Forge. But I am the daughter of Ray and Faye Hunley. I came back here about 10 years ago because of my parents and the farm that actually isn't, they didn't just say they were conservationists, they actually were. They put the whole farm that they owned over 856 acres and three miles of creek that are at the bottom of this wind farm, all in conservation easements. They don't claim, they didn't claim to be conservationists, they actually were. And they died not knowing what they had would be protected and what would happen. Um, so, Body type county government should not allow an industry to have an open door policy by lifting the deletion of a five year ex special exemption permit. What precedents will this set for our futures? An open door policy all along, as long as money is promised. There is no guarantee of anything in our future. We should all realize this from what has happened this year. I sincerely hope the warnings are not ignored at the cost of our own peril. Sound county planning clearly cannot be based on the wishes of those who come to exploit our state's natural resources for their own financial gain. The wind industry has nothing to do with helping us get off fossil fuels or solve environmental problems. Some scientists believe these industrial machines 
will make certain species extinct, including the endanger our endangered golden eagles and bats. Now they are asking to build 680 foot turbines on our mountains. How environmentally responsible is that to increase the height in an area where they have already admitted they will have to curtail the 550 foot turbines because they will surely slaughter bats at alarming rates. They ignore the migratory paths of our birds and animals as though they are non-existent. As a commercial sign artist, let me explain some of the visual characteristics of wind turbines which make them challenging to integrate into landscapes. All vertical elements produce a high degree of contrast in a landscape, especially when they're taller than the surrounding trees. They will surely overrun our iconic scenic mountain views. Massive turbines on top of them may risk our scenic river status. Our home is known for its history and beautiful vistas. Might this be social, a socially destructive path to take? Our family farmhouse used to stood through many 100-year floods without being breached as water came within the homes and cabins. As planners, you know what blasting tops of mountains, permanent deforestation, and permanent roads do to a watershed on top of a mountain. More damaging floods will occur. Well, we're friends. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The time's up. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else to go to the podium? Good evening. My name is Dave Condon, 5520 McKinney Hollow Road, Fancastle District. Before I start, did you all receive a package that I left for each of you? It contains a email sent Friday along with a May 11th uh, letter, five page or six page. Also in that package today is an updated version uh, dated May 11th. We, we did receive that, thank you. All right, I will ask that each one of you, if you have the time to take a uh, look at that, there are serious questions. Now let me start. I reviewed the uh, original permit application and the current SEP. I found uh, fatal flaws in it. First off, the uh, wind ordinance under wind study, second sentence, uh, states to the effect that all wind data should be provided or submitted. That wasn't done. Uh, and uh, people in the gallery requested that information. They denied uh, saying it was proprietary. They should be made out accountable because you need to check the viability. The other things that I noted that were not included uh, was the addition of replacement of wind blades as well as the turbines. Wind blades every 10 years, turbines every 10 to 15 years. It's the 30 year project, which if it starts will cease in not, uh, 2050, long after I'm dead. Probably most of you as well. So uh, with that, uh, the wind blades uh, present a problem. They're considered waste, whether they, they do have carcinogenic materials in it, uh, including OSHA standard uh, SOP warning labels uh, that are uh, with some of the products. But the problem is it does not say how this is going to be transported to the transfer station. For the record, as you know, the county landfill will be capped uh, at the end of this year because of uh, its breaches capacity. According to also something that was not stated, the European model, uh, starting with Germany in 2005, uh, has now no longer accepts fiberglass. So that's a problem. Technology is here in the country. They failed to state, the, uh, I believe it's Fiberglass Global Solutions, which is in my letter, uh, has a building, uh, places in Texas and Iowa that can take that. Who's going to pay for the shipping? That's not even discussed. Who's going to pay for the landfill? This momentum uh, waste, even if, you know, even if uh, it's accepted. And then because of the no landfill back in the t uh, 2031, who's going to take this waste? They haven't designed, haven't said who or what. 
the other thing that is uh, concerned is how they're going to uh, demolish these wind vanes. As you know, it's fiberglass reinforced plastics, uh, and everything is a petroleum byproduct, and again, a carcinogenic. And uh, but uh, it's up to the locality and state as to how they want to classify it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hold on. One, one second. Thank you. Now, there is one other. There is one other concern. It's called fiberglass. Uh, du airborne your dust. Time, your time is up. All right, well, please read, read my letter. But if you don't, uh, we if you don't, we if you don't read reading. the letter, I'm just speaking on behalf of future generations who could possibly health issues be encountered, plus also the, uh, you've got to tie down yeah. who's going to pay what because you could be held Thank liable. You. If people cannot pay, uh, pay their bills, Thank the you. county will be held liable for millions. Thank you. By the record, I am not averse to winning as long as it's better. Is there better. anyone else in the budget to speak? Are there any others in the budget to speak? Yes, please come in. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you very much. My name is Tenny Mudge. I reside in Rockbridge County. I may be from Rockbridge, but as I'm sure you are aware, the northernmost turban is in the junction of both Botetourt, Allegheny, and Rockbridge County. I have been coming to these meetings for four years. I planned to speak at the very first meeting, but was too afraid. I spent these four years learning all I can about the wind industry in Apex. I learned that the making of a turbine is not at all green. It is a highly polluting and toxic industry that thousands of tons of cement would go into each crater that is blasted on the fragile mountaintop that thousands of gallons of oil and hydraulic fluids are used, that ironically forests that fight climate change would be cut down for an industrial road network to climb the steep terrain and clear the ridge top. Endangered and threatened species of bats would be killed. Federally endangered golden eagles would die as they fly these very ridges in documented migration routes. The turbines would violate the 2010 comprehensive plan which calls to preserve scenic views and limit ridge line development. I learned the project hurts the economics of our world-famous Blue Ridge Vistas, that scenic overlooks of the National Byway of the Blue Ridge Parkway would be scarred, as demonstrated on the Apex Viewshed Analysis. Our beloved designated Upper James Scenic River would be too industrialized to enjoy, and the project would bisect the Virginia Outdoor Foundation designated Wildlife Corridor. The counties of Botetourt, Rockbridge, and Allegheny would suffer vast viewshed and noise devastation, as would large tracts of land preserved by conservation easement. I learned other communities regret the day they thought wind turbines were a win-win as they watched them spew oil, catch on fire, and produce no energy at all for long periods of time. Apex had no private sector buyer because the project wasn't viable for two and a half years. Then they proposed that turbines need to be taller. In fact, the tallest turbines in the United States, untested on mountain ridges by a company that has never done a ridge top installation. The Antares report does not encourage the use of massively, massively taller turbines and even states 680 feet would be large even by industry standards and the permanent 550 height is well within industry practices. All the negative impacts of the 550 turbines just got a whole lot worse with 680 feet. You are giving up far more than ever can be gained four years later and here we still are. Please vote to deny the proposed changes to increase the maximum turbine height and reject the proposal to delete the five-year SEP timeline. Enough is enough. Citizens have been coping with how bad is this going to be for years. The clear choice is a no vote to stop the mass madness for the citizens of Bogota and your friends in surrounding counties. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate it. Yeah, what else then? All right, is there anyone on the phone line that we wishes to speak? If there's anybody on the phone that wants to provide some comments, please press five star on your phone so we know to unmute you. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to start unmuting at this time. Please get on the phone line. Yes, my name is 
Steve Mace, do you hear? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, give me your, uh, give me your name and address, please. Yeah, my name is Steve Neese. I live at 750 Morris Creek Road in Lexington, Virginia, just two miles from this project. I'm also an engineer. APAX is asking to raise the height of the turbines to 650 feet because of new technology. If you do a review of the new technology they are proposing, you will learn that none of these turbine, turbines have been, been deployed anywhere in the world. Some of them have been ordered in Europe, but not fully constructed in, in service. Obviously, they have not been deployed and tested in a mountaintop environment. Winds in the mountain environment are different than those experienced in the plains of central United States. While the winds in the Midwest are stiff and steady and typically in one direction, the winds on the mountaintops are gust, gusty, rapidly changing direction and turbulent, updrafts and changing direction frequently. These wind tur turbulent winds will apply huge stresses on the blades and the tower that, that cannot be modeled in engineering design. While having the tallest turbines in the United States might make good headlines for politicians, is allowing untested equipment in such a prominent location meeting your responsibility to protect the public. You should stick to the 550 feet high restriction until this taller new technology has been fully vetted and tested in a mountaintop environment by someone else other than the residents here in Virginia. That is the prudent approach to take. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else on the front line? Anyone on the front line wishing to speak? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, you can be heard. This is Jeff Scott at the 1023 Smoky Road in Lexington. The requirement by APEX to amend their special exemption permit from the Montauk Wood Orange should not even be in the agenda for today. The two most significant documents that need time to be carefully reviewed, which were the uh, report from Ontario and the staff report, were not made available until late on May 6th. Another comment has not even been posted on the website as of today. In the short amount of time that I had to look at the report from Ontario, I concentrated on the research into the question of the impact of industrial wind turbines on property values. One of the studies, studies cited was based on data from densely populated urban areas. Why the conclusions of the urban area study were described makes me wonder about the reason it was included. The last time I checked, I don't think Montana County is a densely populated urban area. As part of the suggested changes to the existing wind ordinance, Virginians for Responsible Energy submitted a set of documents in February that included many references. In the section of that submittal on the impact of industrial wind projects on property values, there are several references to studies that do show a negative impact. Those studies were not referenced in the entire report. Why is that? Speaking of the submittal by Virginians for Responsible Energy, have you read uh, all of our documents uh, that we submitted. Probably can't answer me at this point, but you, you need to uh, please make sure that you do. When Virginia's for Responsible Energy approached Ms. Pendleton about submitting an official request for changing the wind ordinance, she suggested that we save the application fee since the Board of Supervisors had charged her with reviewing the existing ordinance to simply provide her with suggested changes. Virginia's for Responsible Energy did this, submitting a list of some significant improvements to the ordinance with a comprehensive set of references to justify the changes. Since none of the suggested changes are in the version of the ordinance being considered, Virginia's for Responsible Energy assumes that all of the suggested changes were rejected. But we have not received any detailed information explaining why none of the suggested changes have been included. Should we have paid the application fee to ensure that the changes would be reviewed with the same thoroughness as the changes suggested by APEC? If the purpose of this meeting is to actually produce a wind ordinance that helps Montauk County develop guidelines to regulate industrial wind projects and protect the county, why is it that none of the suggested changes from Virginians for Responsible Energy are included? We need to suspend the vote on a special exception and wind ordinance change request until you have sufficient time to thoroughly review 
all of the documents, all of the changes, submitted by all of the parties, and all of the comments. Why just consider the changes wanted by a developer who is only interested in making money? As a question, the business practices and who has targeted the most environmentally and visually significant location in Bonacow County for destruction. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. <coughs> Are there others? Mr. Chairman, there are five more comments. I'm going to meet the next person. Uh, Please proceed. All right. Uh, and uh, I think very 
informing, and I, I would suspect that the board did as well. Um, having said all that, I, I would like to point out that some 10 years ago or more, I served on the Department of Environmental Quality's RAP, or Regulatory Advisory Panel, to help define the rules for the current permit by rule. And the reason I feel this is relevant is that there's been quite new, a number of comments that are concerned or expressed concerns about human health, about wildlife, impact on wildlife, other environmental impacts and concerns. Uh, I, I, th I think it's worth remembering that the state permitting process above and beyond the local ordinance and its requirement is probably one of the most compelling in the country. It requires significant uh, studies and mitigation planning and, and really puts the developer in, in the position of having to be taking very careful steps to ensure the safety and the integrity and performance of a wind power plant such as is being proposed here. Uh, I want to make that point uh, as well. I, I'd also like to just reiterate a couple of quotes from my own comments that I submitted. Uh, namely that this project, as now envisioned, will result in a more robust economic outlook than what, have, what had been proposed previously, would result in reduced operating and maintenance costs, certainly reduced impact on the environment and surroundings during installation and operations, and would at the very worst have comparable but probably lesser visual impacts despite the taller light because of the fewer number of curtains to be installed. And along those lines, I think it's important to note that APEX's uh, return to this process is critical because of the improvements in technology and practices. Uh, previous commenter uh, suggested that the notion that APEX would be installing new technology is something to be concerned about. Uh, I, I think it, it's important to note here that there are protocols based to ensure that the new technology is indeed up to the challenge of performing in the conditions that, there, that are going to be uh, enforced in this particular case. Uh, finally, let me, let me just again reiterate another comment that I have I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, your time is up and we're going to have to move along. Thank you. I appreciate your comments and uh, we also uh, uh, appreciate the fact that you submitted others. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is there anyone else on the line? Good evening. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, hear you well. Name and address, please. Yeah, John Scarborough, 532 Locust Bottom Road, Eagle Rock. Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, thank you guys. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm not going to give a speech or you know, all the normal stuff you've already heard. Um, I guess I'm just going to run down a few things that I've been jotting some notes while everyone was talking here. Um, first one, kind of a question. Uh, I know that the county has met with APEX more than once at their uh, offices. Um, have you guys have you guys met with the opposition at all? I don't believe you have. Um, I know on the comment page there's at least ten comments missing that were con or against the project. So I hope those get uh, distributed out to you guys. Um, most of the pros I see are from out of the county or related to the Fraley's or somehow uh, involved with APEX, such as with Pierre Glow, uh, that professor that was just talking. Um, so, you know, they talk about view sheds, they don't have to look at it. They live in Richmond, they live in Crozet. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I read it throws that uh, our electric rates are going to go down. That's not true. Uh, North of is going to increase our rates to pay for renewable energy. Uh, there'll be very few permanent jobs, probably uh, very few temporary jobs, because there aren't many companies in Bogot that can construct these. Uh, I see two revenue streams, one for freight, one for APEX. Uh, the opposition has provided overwhelming evidence for why we should move forward. Uh, the people pulled the wind towers. You know, I hear conservation, 
I hear tax money. I hear jobs. I don't believe any of it. It's not conservation when you blast the top of the mountain off. Uh, and back to the, I think it was the Sierra Club, said there will be more wind farms. Uh, one of the letters I wrote to you guys said, we're going to open up Botetourt to windmills on every ridge line. I think they can burn my point. Uh, that's all I got for today. Thank you. Thank you. Where are your comments? Mr. Chairman, we have two more callers. Uh, as a reminder to the callers, if you have questions, please press five star on your phone and uh, we'll unmute your mind one after the other. Uh, when you're here unmuted, please proceed with the comments. Next call, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Christopher West, 1611 Ottawa Avenue, Richmond. I'm the Executive Director of Conservatives for Clean Energy. We're a nonprofit advocacy group that strongly supports the development of clean energy technologies across the Commonwealth. We strongly support the Rocky Forge Wind Project and respectfully encourage planning commissions to endorse it as well. Rocky Forge Wind could be the Commonwealth's first onshore wind farm and also which represents a very important step in Virginia's energy transition. Uh, Southwest Virginia is uniquely positioned to take the lead in onshore wind and Rocky Forge is ideally suited to be our first wind farm. It is, of course, as you know, located on a remote tract of land in order to the top and has a strong wind resources and is far from occupied homes. The construction of the project will support more than 250 temporary jobs as well as seven full-time permanent jobs. The project will generate enough power for up to 21,000 homes and provide a recurring stream of local revenue for county schools and essential government services totaling in the tens of millions over the life of the project. The updated project plans will allow Rocky Forge to generate the same amount of power with fewer turbines while providers providing the same amount of tax revenue to the county. Adjusting the plans to accommodate the best available technology is the sort of thing any responsible business would do, and these adjustments assure that Rocky Forge creates the most possible value for Bogota County and the Commonwealth. Um, in 2015, this project was unanimously supported by the Bobbitt County Board of Supervisors, and we respectfully hope that this project will receive the same kind of support this go round. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And I believe there's one more. Back is there another speaker on the line? Yes, there is. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, would you state your name and address, please? Of course. This is Sarah Laura Fine from 3445 Sentinel Trail. And I'm going to start off by uh, quoting the Old Testament, uh, Malachi 319, stating, A day is coming that will burn like a furnace. Its remedy will be the sun's rays and, wind, and wings. So I think that we all probably know that uh, the other forms of energy fracking and drilling for oil and coal mining all really do destroy the earth and it creates a lot of pollution. And we're aware of that and we've been made really aware of it recently by all the pictures uh, along across the world, including in our areas as well, that show that without the dirty fuel and the fossil fuels, the air is clear, people can breathe, the animals are all returning. And that's what we want. We want to keep it the way it is in terms of the conservation of the earth and the land and the animals and the wildlife and our water and our air being clean. So let's make use of this time. I think that Mother Nature is giving us a window right now, a unique opportunity. I'm very sad about the cost of lives in the process, but my God, she's tried fires and floods and earthquakes and Nothing has worked, so I think this has been the last straw to show us humans what our choices are and how to change things now while we still have a chance to. So let's get rid of the endless federal subsidies and the state subsidies that prop up archaic, outmoded, failing industries that, you know, like fossil fuel and fracking and all that. And let's change now to restructure 
all the energy grids. This is the, our time to do it. They're doing it all across the world. Why should we be the only ones not to be part of progress? In uh, Austria, just yesterday, they canceled the last coal mines that, that are there, and instead they're using um, tracks of wind turbines, wind farms, like what we're talking about here in Bodetat. And same in France. In France now they have up to eight acres in, uh, of nothing but wind turbines, and they're, it's covering all the, the um, costs. Job losses in the fossil fuel industry would be more than offset in the renewable energy by focusing on these wind turbines. It's already being done elsewhere, Colorado and everywhere. Every dollar spent on decarbonized energy transition would yield billions of dollars by eliminating the cost of climate change devastation and the deadly, deadly global impacts of air pollution and from forest fires and from the storms that have come from disrupting the earth. This, is, this may not be perfect, the wind turbines, but this is the closest thing that we've got. And it's thank you for your comments, the time okay. though. And thank you for your comments your call in. Thank you so much, sir. Is there another call on the line? Mr. Chairman, we have two more calls. I'm going to leave the next couple of these Thank you. Call the Hello? Hello? Hello, oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Would you state your name and address, please? Bruce Scott, 1023 Smoky Row, Lexington. Thank you. I would just like to, to comment on the statement by the Sierra Club uh, representative. And if you look at the National Sierra Club's website, where they have quite a bit of information about uh, appropriate areas for these industrial wind facilities, the statement they made, and I'm quoting, says, the Sierra Club opposes development in protected areas such as national and state parks, national monuments, wilderness areas, wildlife refuges, designated roadless areas, critical habitat, and designated habitat recovery areas for wildlife, and areas of cultural significance, sacred lands, and other areas that have to emphasize this special, scenic, natural, or environmental value. In these areas, it is inappropriate to build wind turbines, roads, transmission lines, or any other structure related to wind development. I don't know how you could be clearer than that statement, and for the local Virginia chapter of the Sierra Club and the local chapter of the Sierra Club in Rona to endorse this project and say that it is nearly up as perfect as you can get. There is wrote the fellow Dan, I think is his first name, the local Sierra Club in Rona, wrote an op-ed in the Rona Times that stated how this was the uh, most perfect site possible for this project, totally ignoring what the National Sierra Club has to say about what is an appropriate area for winter. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And I believe we have one more on the line. That is correct. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, and staff. My name is Sherry Smith Crumley. I live at 2917 Tree Bark Road, Buchanan. My husband and I are conservationists. We have put our 380 acres of land in Bobtock County in a conservation easement. Wildlife and its habitat is one of the most important things in our lives. I served nine years on the board of the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, and I am currently serving my 14th year on the national board of the National Wild Turkey Federation. We are conservationists. I am in favor of the county amending the SDP permit to allow for the newer, more efficient wind turbines, the proposed wind farm will be located on a property of several thousand acres owned by one family in a rural part of Botetourt County. In my opinion, wind energy is the least invasive form of energy. The effect on wildlife will be minimal. In fact, more birds die by hitting the windows of homes than will be hurt by the turbines 
according to the American Bird Conservancy. The wind farm will have relatively little impact on the land where it is proposed. Having known the friendly family for over 30 years, I know how important and how passionate they are about wildlife. And they would do nothing to hurt the wildlife that they have spent 40 plus years creating habitat for. I hope that you will approve this amended SCP permit and let our county lead the way in wind energy in Virginia. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other on the line who have Hearing none, we will close the public hearing and discuss this among ourselves. We've got a picture back. Questions or discussion, ideas, motions? We've heard a lot of information there. Yeah, we were here today. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mr. Nice, we uh, we are. Um, I'm not sure if they wish to speak on the text amendments or not, but this, we have another presentation on the actual Rocky Ford project after the text amendment, or we could do a presentation on that. We just want to make sure those are two separate action items. Let your pleasure, gentlemen. I'd prefer to keep it separate, I think, so then I get something confusing. It sounds good. Okay, I, I agree with you, Mr. Foster. Any other comments from any of the other commissioners? All right. Having heard the, uh, the comments and the information provided by Mr. Thompson, uh, do we have uh, a motion? I'm just having a, a tough time getting rid of uh, our, our five year SED. However, I think that uh, we need to send it off to the board. Uh, and certainly I'll have some more questions a little later uh, of APAC is representative, of course, and uh, we have digested a lot of information. Folks out there have done a lot of hard work. They're, you know, they're friends and neighbors of ours, and uh, we are looking at fewer turbines and all that, but uh, uh, I certainly respect all the comments, and uh, but I think we need to at least see this through, allow the board to take a real hard look at it. Um, I'm moving into text amendments to chapter 25, section 446, wind energy systems as attached to the report prepared by staff before to the board with a recommendation of approval. The recommendation made on the basis that the requirements of section 25, 581.1, and the zoning ordinance has been satisfied that the proposal can serve the public necessity, convenience, general welfare, and good zoning practice. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Is there a second or question or discussion? Can you spell out that SEP completely one more time, please?
The specific like that I don't have I don't have it in front of me. You see that in your package and it's part of your uh, it's part of the agenda. Hang on, hang on, let me check my text one. Hydro D. Mr. Chair, Mr. Turman, did you get the information you needed? I did, thank you very much. All right. I'm sorry, someone. Is that Mr. Nyquist? Yes. Your motion. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Paul. Is there any possibility? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to go over. Uh, yes. Is there any possibility that we can separate those? There's two proposed text amendments. Can we separate those and vote on those separately? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I'm feeling okay about one of them, I'm not feeling okay about the other one. Um, and just wondering if we could, could vote on those separately and, and um, possibly give the Board of Supervisors a little better direction. You, you want to, uh, Mr. Knightley, do you want to amend your motion or get some clarity on what uh, Mr. Kidd is saying? As far as I thought we were uh, voting on the text amendment, amendment regarding the wind energy separately from the other text amendment on the cluster development. What other text amendment? Well, we've got B and C. Are we voting on B separately from C? Yes. I guess what my yeah, question is, yeah, I'm, trying to confuse everybody. I'm not trying to confuse everybody, but there's two proposed tax amendments. My question is, can we separate the two proposed tax amendments and vote on each one of those separately uh, under B? There, there should be three, Mr. Kidd, or three sections. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, there is three. Yes, yeah. sorry. And you're proposing to break those three out to... I don't, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I'd like to break out is the uh, expiration of the uh, five-year uh, term limit. Um, and I might be doing wrong in, in looking at it that way. Um, so let's just keep it right up. Okay. Uh, that way. Yeah, I think that's what Mr. Knightley was speaking to is uh, before he made the motion. Yeah, I mean, I would like, I could amend the motion and we could vote on the three separate. That's fine with me. What is the resolution? 
link to this thing. I don't have a problem with that. I would like some information on the hundred feet of the equipment and uh, structures. I'm not sure what it was prior to the event. It's an addition, Mr. Foster. It was in the previously. Okay. Okay. All right, is it a consensus um, among the uh, commission members that we vote on each of these three parts of B Tech Amendments? Yeah, I agree. Yes. Anybody disagree? Okay, that's the way we'll take them. Professor uh, Knifey, would you like to uh, address? Each of those individuals. Okay, I'm looking at the uh, amendment number one is utility scale wind energy system requirements. Right. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I'm just wondering about voting on a couple of these without having talked with uh, APAC members. Be no greater than 680 feet in height. 
The project is proposed to be located along approximately three and a half miles of the southernmost portion of North Mountain, with an entrance generally located on the north side of secondary Route 622, which is Dagger Spring Road, approximately 5.2 miles east of the intersection of Route 622 and secondary Route 694, which is Gala Loop, to be accessed by a proposed gravel road identified on the real property identification map to Bonnetop County in section 13, parcel 2, and section 20, parcel 3 and 3A. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a concept matter of aerial photograph which depicts the site that's outlined in red. Next slide, please. You will see um, that this particular parcel and that's all around it are known as SB, Forest Conservation. There's predominantly agricultural A1 and SB, and then also the property is uh, bounded by National Forest and Rockbridge County as well. Next slide. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the process again. In October, well, first in uh, 2016, January 26, 2016, uh, the SEC was approved with 17 conditions uh, for the uh, construction of a utility scale wind energy system and a maximum of 25 turbines at 550 feet. On October 31st of 2019, Apex Clean Energy and Jerry Fraley filed a request to amend those conditions. At that time, as the ordinance uh, did not allow for turbines of that height, the application was considered incomplete by the zoning administrator. On February 25th of 2020, the Board of Supervisors authorized staff to procure an independent consultant and move forward at the discretion of the zoning administrator reviewing that application complete in order to process it um, for public hearing. That occurred on March 9, 2020. Next slide, please. Okay. So I want to give a project summary. Again, the approval that was granted in 2016 is still valid today. Those 17 conditions which were approved in the package have not yet been met because some of those construct some of those conditions are not yet part of the site plan application, which could still be filed today. Building permits could be filed today. And with the approval of the administrative that particular project could be constructed as approved. Again, as part of tonight's request, there are two conditions, two applications before you, which first is the text amendment. Now we are moving on to discuss special exception permit. So the application to amend the previously approved conditions states that the updates are related to the increase in height of the turbine and the maximum anticipated capacity of each and the related decrease in the number of turbines. As a result, a revised shadow flipper study, cell model, concept plan, visual impact analysis, operations and maintenance plan information, and environmental inventory and impact statement, historic and cultural resource assessment, a post-construction sound analysis, shadow flicker analysis, and decommissioning plan were included and take to take into consideration a scenario in which there would be 22 turbines at 680 feet in height rather than the currently approved 550. However, the applicant also states that the number of turbines will likely decrease dramatically as the turbines approach the new maximum height of 680 feet. In their application, the applicant provided a table of examples of turbines with generator capacity, number of turbines, and total height that ranged from 492 feet to 675 feet in height. Next slide, please. Okay. As happened in 2016, a third party consultant was procured at the expense of the applicant to perform an independent review of the application. In addition to the information provided by the applicant, the Interior Group and their sub, CHB, reviewed the existing ordinance, 
the proposed change of conditions, specific questions raised by the Board of Supervisors, revisions to the existing code which were presented by the public, the original application, as well as the approved permit by rule document, which um, from the state DQ. Next slide. And Harry Group is on hand also to make a presentation as well as representatives from Apex Clean Energy, but the findings from the third party, which Ms. Heidi Osbrook is, is available via be be a to permit at the conclusion of this presentation. The increased turbine height included in the application is in line with industry, industry trends. The trends in the industry are clearly moving towards larger wind turbines with larger meaning, taller towers, and bigger rotor diameter, which do have advantages from an energy production standpoint. However, the originally permitted 550 foot height does not represent obsolete technology. More than half of the wind turbine applications filed with the FAA in the first part of 2019 were for turbines with a total height of less than 500 feet. If the board does not make any modifications to the height conditions associated with the FCC, the original 550 foot height limit would mean that it is much more likely that the project will have 25 wind turbines as in the original application rather than the 22 to 13 proposed by APEX in your current application. For example, the configuration that they provided at 22 turbines would have a total turbine height of 551 feet Although APEX also presents a 20 turbine configuration that has a total turbine height of 492 feet. The board may find it worthwhile to consider a one foot height increase in exchange for fewer turbines. While reducing the number of turbine locations would decrease the impact in the immediate area of the project site, there is a trade off, and that is taller turbines would, decrease, taller turbines would increase the overall visibility of the project, which is demonstrated in the visual impact assessment. Next slide, please. Additional information provided by the area that talks about the rationale for the trend using taller power because the height places the swept areas of the rotor in areas of stronger and less turbulent wind. The larger rotors allow for a greater swept area and more energy generation for turbines. Based on that, APEX's request appears to be aligned with industry trends, but two points are clear. APEX is considering using rotors notably larger diameter than average, as well as a hub height in some of the larger configurations it provided that is taller than average. In the extreme, this is leading to the possibility of the turbine being large, even by the existing installation standards. Additionally, the originally permitted 550 feet height is still well within current industry practices. Next slide. Generally, staff agrees with the findings in the report. But as with the original SCP request, staff's main concern with the application is the conceptual layout of the majority of the features of the Staff expressed concern, concern to Ann Perry's again, as they did in 2016, regarding how the studies and models would change if turbines were sited in different locations, were smaller, or were fewer in number all of which would be considerable changes to the project. Staff has had concerns with the lack of specificity with regards to the turbine models and height, which again results in a lack of specificity in the submitted revised process plan. If the request to modify the original conditions are approved, staff suggests replacing the conditions with any combination in whole or in part of those provided by staff. The conditions that are provided were derived from conditions and submitted by the applicant, by reviewed by interiors and staff. And the planning commission may also review the availability of alternative custom height and turbine scenarios identified by the applicant, to determine whether an alternative to the applicant's request is more appropriate for the subject location. Next slide. Additionally, there are 17 conditions that were provided in the background report prepared by staff, which were updated based on the applicant's request. Any of these conditions can be modified. Conditions can be added by the Planning Commission or deleted by the Planning Commission and it's at the pleasure of the Planning Commission 
uh, the recommended conditions that they may wish to send to the Board of Supervisors with whatever recommendation they deem appropriate to make. I will, uh, next slide here, thank you. We'll comment very briefly before we talk about the public comment though that the way that conditions work is the next step in the process, if there were an approval, there are many things that would need to have to happen in order for a project to move forward to being the construction. And I'll go into detail on that in a second. I hope I have another slide for you all. Um, at 6.44 p.m. on Sunday, there were 43 comment letters or comment notes that were supportive of the SEC changes and there were 55 in opposition. Next slide. Right, so again, um, in summary, the project can move forward through the permitting phase at the county level as it was originally approved in 2016. If approved, with the recommended conditions or any conditions the planning commission deems appropriate, there would still need to be compliance with all state and federal regulations. APEX would need to revise their application, their permit by rule application, and receive approval from DEQ at the state level. And all necessary studies, models, and plans would need to be updated and provided with actual turbine models and specifications in order for any of the reviews to be to take place at the county level. Would this mean subdivision plat review, flight planning review, or any building permit application? So at that point, the conditions which are related to the provision of flight plan application would come into effect at that point. Not sooner. Drew, I'm not sure if I have another slide. You have to answer one more time. Okay. So that was concluded. Let me make sure there's nothing else in my background report. Again, the, my, my presentation this evening to you all, commissioners, is based on the premise that the application was approved in 2016 with those conditions in place, and the request today is the modification of that. Um, and so at this time, I will, I will be happy to answer any questions you all have, and also just, again, let you know that Ms. Heidi Osbrook is on the line. Um, as well as I believe Charlie Johnson is on the line who made that clean energy. So, thank you very much, Nicole. That was a, a good bringing us up to date on this project. Uh, question, John. Mr. Tam, I have one one question. If we were were to approve this. And there are approximately 13 tur turbines as opposed to 22. Is that going to reduce the amount of coverage on the top of the, the, the mountain? Would it be a shorter distance or still extend out the same amount? If that makes sense. It does, and, and I believe the applicant can speak to that. And again, okay. Um, if, if you may condition um, anything related to that that you would wish to, wish to if that were something that you would want to add. Okay, thanks. Other questions for Nicole? Uh, yeah, Nicole, the, uh, on the site we have the staff recommending conditions stated today. Those 17, is that just was just on the uh, screen? Yes, well those were the general uh, the general topic of each one of the conditions. And they, they've all been updated. But, but so these are up are they uh, mirrors of the original seventeen. They are similar to the original seventeen. There have been some revisions and um, some updates to So these would completely supersede that, correct? Oh yeah, they would replace them. That's right. That's all I have. Thank you. Other questions? Hearing none, we'll move to the public. Would you like to make sure? I mean, all of us have a copy of the paper report. Yes. Okay. Heidi, would you like to speak to the planning? 
do that. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, as Nicole mentioned, um, my name is Heidi Albrook. I'm a senior project manager with the Ontario Group. Uh, and Terry is a consulting and engineering firm that has been in existence since 1992 with an exclusive focus on renewable energy. And we assist clients at the level of state, federal, and local government in policy development and program support. And we have extensive experience in renewable energy consulting with the private sector, including feasibility analysis, project management, and project development, as well as providing owners and engineering services for a variety of mature and emerging renewable energy technologies. We conducted the initial independent review of APEX's application for a special exception permit. Um, and I submitted our findings to the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors in 2016, along with a list of recommended conditions for approval. In February of this year, we were asked to update our technical review based on the revised application for special exception permit that was submitted by APEX and identify any issues that require additional research and provide recommendations for developer or county action. We also had a VHC provide supplemental environmental review. Um, we provided our list of summary comments as well as a recommendation of additional conditions. As uh, Nicole said, um, one of the main questions that was asked of us was whether the 680 foot height limit was in line with um, industry trends. We conducted some background research um, based on permit applications filed with the FAA and published data from um, the Department of Energy on installed wind projects through up through um, early 2019 um, that were published in the 2018 Wind Energy Market Report um, and found that the trends in the industry are clearly moving towards larger wind turbines taller power, bigger rotor diameter, and they do have advantages for energy production. Um, however, the originally permitted 560 foot height limit is not obsolete technology, as the whole state more than half of the wind turbine um, application on the file with the FAA in the first part of 2019 um, were for a total height of less than 500 feet. Um, APEX presented a range of configurations ranging from 22 to 13 wind turbines and 492 feet to the 680 foot limit. So you can see that there are still a range of new new to the market, you know, current technology turbines that exist below the 550 foot limit. Um, as you get taller, that's when you start reducing the number of proposed turbines down to 13 when you have the, the much bigger turbines with much larger uh, generators. Um, one thing we want to make sure um, that the Planning Commission and the Board understand is that um, when you start to have the 550 foot limit, you are going to be limiting what you can get out of these turbines. Um, we know that the technical um, feasibility of this project and the energy production potential are of a concern because you want this thing to be viable and you know larger turbines, taller towers allow the developer to harvest more energy. We also recognize that um, you have an interest in ensuring that you preserve county characteristics that you value. So as we know, the taller turbines would increase overall visibility. Um, the aspects of the project, which include the shadow flicker model and uh, sound modeling, do remain in line with the limits that were proposed in the conditions to the special exception permit before. Um, and those would need to, again, be demonstrated that they were met by any configuration that is presented for uh, site plan approval. Um, The, the other main the other main considerations that we that we had were related to decommissioning plan um, the decommissioning plan and the decommissioning cost estimate report because the county does want to make sure that their interest in ensuring any project that is no longer operational is 
decommission will be able to be decommissioned. Um, so we include several recommended conditions related to that, uh, including evaluation of um, where waste could be transported outside of the 30 mile radius that's assumed in the decommissioning report. And um, as people have noted, the bottom top left county landfill will be closed by the end of this project life. Uh, we also recommend that um, the operations and maintenance plan addresses replacement and disposal costs for any components that reach end of life prior to end of the turbine's life. Um, we want to make sure that the decommissioning plan specifies how waste generated by decommissioning activities, including sawdust or byproducts of cutting turbine blades, um, will be addressed in a way that minimizes potential impact to the project site. And um, we also want to make sure that the decommissioning surety that the developer must provide to the county is calculated for the decommissioning costs, not including potential salvage value, rather than the net cost after salvage. All right. Any any other comment, Tidy? Uh, not at this time. All right. Do uh, we have any questions, Tidy? Yeah, I, I've got one or two. It's All right, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, the decommissioning uh, estimates. Uh, to, your suggestion is to not recognize the salvageable. Uh, value of the parts is that from what we saw in the report? Right. Well, we're, what we recommend is that you base your surety on the estimated total cost of decommissioning, not including the potential salvage value. And the rationale for that is that one of the main um, one of the main reasons for the decommissioning surety to exist is so that if for some reason the project owner is unable to decommission it, the funds are available for the county to oversee that activity. So if you subtract out the potential salvage value, then you are having a substantially reduced pool of money. And um, as you can see it reading in the decommissioning report and in our report, especially when you start looking at these turbines with exceptionally large towers, uh, the, the steel value is a very, very large component of this estimated salvage value. So this is a, a specialty activity that requires specialty equipment and specialty skills since you basically have to reverse construct the turbine. And um, you want to make sure that your surety allows this to happen regardless of what estimated value has been um, for any of these commodities and somebody has to be hired and whether or not the person who is doing the decommissioning activity will be able to be paid after that salvage value has been realized um, is a question that you don't want to have to wrangle with if you are left holding the bag on this project. Exactly, not to mention they're very volatile, can be the the pricing structure can be very volatile at that particular time. Um, exactly. And you do have provisions that it must be updated, um, updated every three years. But at the same time, we we recommend that you base your surety on the total cost of each mission. Question, another question you may or may not be able to answer. Um, are there um, land-based wind turbines this high in use in, in the U.S.? Okay. Um, I don't know where they are specifically um, now. What I reviewed was the data that was largely focused on what had been built in 2018 and through the first part of 2019 in our report. Um, let me just flip through what I have here. So in, um, in page 8 of the Ontario report, I've included uh, a graph and a table of um, the turbine hub height by commercial operation year showing the trend in turbine, type, turbine hub height increase and you can see what percentage of turbine 
pump height, which are roughly the tower height, um, fall within the ranges. So you can see that um, in 2018, 1.6% uh, of the installed towers were over 100 meters in height, which is 328 feet. Um, well, when you start talking about the large rotors, which combine, what help you get to that 680 foot, uh, let's see, um, those are much more common. 30% um, of the installed projects had rotor diameters that were in excess of 120 meters, and 56.9% um, of these projects had rotors between 110 and 120 meters. Larger rotors mean larger swept out area and more power generation. So that, that is definitely a trend. But um, there are there are fewer projects that have combined both of these very, very large towers and very, very large uh, rotor diameters. Although that is the direction that the industry is moving. Other questions? Thank you, Mrs. Oliver Brooks. Uh, now we'll have uh, Charlie Johnson with uh, Apex come to the mic. Kara, we have this yes, room, and we will need to uh, ask Mr. Pearson to move forward with this. Yes, there we go. Scott, he's on. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Mr. Johnson, yes. Would you just uh, state your name again for us and give us your answer? Yes, sir. This is Charlie Johnson with Apex Crew Energy, uh, 310 4th Street, Northeast, uh, Suite 300, Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh -huh. Sure thing. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, I uh, appreciate the time this evening. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have uh, from the previous portion of the meeting as well. Um, as I said, I'm Charlie Johnson. I'm the project manager for the Rocky Ford Wind Project. Um, I've been working on this project uh, for Pretty much as long as, as we've been working with bottom top. Um, I've mostly been working in the mid-Atlantic since I started at Apex back in 2013. Um, and as you might remember, I stood before you in 2016 as well. I believe it was the end of 2015 for um, this project, for our regional improvement. Um, I've got a few slides here. I won't, I won't dig into the details that have been covered. Um, I did want to just highlight a few things for you on uh, what we're asking of the county at this, at this stage of the process. Um, so, Jerry, next slide, please. Um, but real quick, just quick background on Apex. We are a, a national company headquartered in Charlottesville, Virginia. So this project means a lot to our company. Um, we develop, we construct, and we operate projects around the country, both utilities, government, and solar. Um, as you can see on the top of the map, um, they vary between operating projects with wind and solar as well as development uh, assets for wind and solar. Next slide, please. Uh, just a quick snip of some of the numbers. Uh, we've, we've got over 1,200 wind turbines currently operating in the U.S. Um, that we are either operating or developed. Um, that's including solar as well. Uh, almost three gigawatts of uh, projects completed, which represents, um, I think, almost $6 billion in investment. Um, our, our operating staff is currently managing about $2 billion uh, worth of assets around the country and in Canada. Next slide, please. A little part on this, so this just shows kind of a track record of our company uh, and all the projects we've, we've developed. Um, some of the notables would be uh, the two IKEA wind projects, one in Illinois and one in Texas, uh, which they purchased from us to offset their uh, North American utility consumption of electricity. And we still operate the, those projects under the Apex banner. So Apex trucks are on site with those projects um, day in, day out. Then another notable on the solar side, um, as well as wind, uh, we did a contract with the U.S. Army down in Fort Hood. Um, we are the, the Fort's uh, retail electric supplier for all of their energy, um, with both an on-site solar project as well as an off-site uh, wind energy project. Next slide, please. Um, just some of the benefits of this project, just to reiterate, um, some of the folks have mentioned all the support that we've had for this project both locally and at the state level. Um, the project has a lot of environmental benefits, uh, whether that's 
uh, offset of CO2 or uh, preservation of land uh, for tra traditional uh, development. Um, the domestic energy supply of this project has the capability to produce uh, up to 21,000 pounds of electricity. Uh, that's utilizing some of the newer technology that has come out uh, in these turbines. And there's significant uh, economic benefits, whether that's local taxes, whether that's cash infusion during construction, um, all of the all of the folks that are working on this wind farm have to eat, have to stay in the tub. Um, they will be bringing money to the community during the construction period as well as operation. Um, and then lastly, just the advanced development of this project. Uh, we've been at hard at work on it for, for years now. Um, there's been a lot of um, progress made, and at this point, you know, we're kind of entering into the final phase of the uh, for the project. Next slide, please. This is just a quick snapshot of some of the, the groups that have endorsed the project, both locally and in the United States. Next slide, please. Um, just to reiterate that traffic doesn't matter, we love our state. Next slide, please. 
So the request before you has been, has been an on through, but essentially what we're asking for was the zoning text level as well as the permit uh, amendment to utilize the dollar technology of turbines that is um, emerging in the market, um, as well as extending our permit to allow for um, construction operation. Um, we're targeting currently at the end of 2021 uh, for operation. Um, and then just allowing us to shift the net tower on the site um, high, high up to the turbine. Which is where the blades are attached to it. Next slide, please. So how you touched on a lot of this, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to answer questions as well, as well, but I'll try to cover it. Um, so as you said, the turbines are getting larger. Um, it's one thing to be looking at what is installed versus the projects that are um, towards the end of development right now. Um, I can tell you that a lot of our projects, we are looking at turbines in this range um, of, of going larger and larger um, names like capacity. Um, to give a few examples of the technology that's already been introduced, um, there's West Texas a and installed turbine in, uh, in Texas as far back as May of 2018 uh, with 653-foot tip height. Um, and as I mentioned, Big Level Wind Farm in, in Pennsylvania, they have turbines over 650 feet as well. Um, that's a 90 megawatt project. Um, to just a note, um, this kind of weaves into the next next piece, but the the as you reach the top tip of the turbine, that's the least visual piece of the turbine um, itself. So the blades um, are actually at the last 30 feet or so, the blade is actually only about four feet in diameter, or in width, I'm sorry. Um, so what you really depict with the eye is that the loud height of the turbine or where the blades are connected to the tower. Next slide, please. This is mentioned by Nicole. Um, we did want to provide just some of the turbine options that we are looking at. Um, by nature, this is a tough part of our industry because the turbines are not chosen until um, very late in the financing of a project. Um, that's just due to the amount of turbines on the market, um, as well as the availability at the time of year that the project is going through financing. Um, turbines typically operate on, a, on an annual basis, uh, with most of your deposits going into spring and early summer. And then by the end of the year, your turbine options diminish dramatically. Uh, because the, the turbine vendors are either sold out or they're looking towards the next year's technology before we start filling those. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a snapshot out of the visual impact study uh, showing the closest neighbor to the project. Um, this neighbor, as, as we mentioned earlier, is supportive of the project. He's um, just over a mile away from any of the turbine location. And as you can see between the top and the bottom, the top is the previous approval of 25 turbines at a 550 foot tip height and the, the bottom picture is a maximum of 22 turbines shown at a maximum height of 600 feet which we propose to actually build fewer if we go to that height uh, based on those, those examples that we've shown in our application. So you can see it's a pretty minimal um, change to the eye just given the, the structure height to start. Next slide please. It might be tough to see on the screens, but it's also in the, the application. Um, the difference that you're seeing here is the pink is where either turbine um, could be visible, noting that the distance dramatically affects um, the visibility of the turbine, as well as uh, topography, which is taken into account here. Um, but the, um, the tree cover, building, community, um, air quality, you name it, are not taken into account for this. So in the, in the impact study, you can see some of the further pictures are, are tougher to depict what the turbines look like from that. Um, this is just based on topography of a flatter or a boulder. Next slide, please. Um, these are just showing our current timeline that we're hoping for. Uh, we're going to be operational by the end of 21. Um, but we have asked for an extension uh, for two years just to cover any sort of delays that could come during the construction process. Next slide. And then I'm happy to answer questions. I'm sure you guys. All right. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Our questions, gentlemen. Well, I'll ask the question I asked you earlier about if you do 13 as opposed to 22, are you taking as much uh, lab space for the 13 as you do the 22? The Yes, sir. Thanks for the question. Um, the short answer is no. Um, the the ridge line currently, currently contemplated is about three and a half miles 
Um, if we were to reduce the turbines enough, we would not use a lot of that ridge line, but we would also spread out the turbines. Um, we, also, we have to comply with the, the county separation um, based on the river size as well, which is makes it more. So you're, you're, both, you're not utilizing some of the ridge line, and you're also reducing the amount of um, turbine locations, thus reducing um, the environmental impact in terms of the river turbine. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. How many turbines do you anticipate if we go to 680? So it's, it's tough to nail it down at this point exactly. Um, that turbine table that I showed you is slide 15 if you want to go to that. Um, Is that, is that the answer to your question? No, sir. I was, I was going to walk you through this real quick. Um, so essentially, we are looking at turbines in the four and a half to, to five and a half, five point six range. Um, so I would say anywhere from from thirteen to, to eighteen turbines is probably where we'll end up. Um, that's not to say that you know a smaller turbine might not be considered, um, just based on market availability. Um, and, and price, mark, market uh, pricing as well. Um, we do run competitive processes for turbines as well. Um, does that help answer your question? I think so. Um, how about uh, are you right away in the easements or basic tours yet? So we are finalizing uh, the remaining ones. Um, we've been given that, asked that question as well. So with our current project design, uh, we have we have signed up the landowners in question with the exception of one, uh, which we are in active negotiations with and have to close it out this month. Uh, that's not to say that you know, small small things here or there during the construction process might um, need updates with the landowners, but we've got long standing relationships with those and um, are comfortable that we we come to agreement with the small changes that we did. How soon do you, uh, I'm having a tough time getting rid of uh, the five-year time limit, but we put a condition on, how soon do you think you can uh, get a site plan and that type of thing uh, to planning and zoning and, uh, you know, get the site plan approved? So getting it approved is, I can't speak to when it would be approved, but our hope would be to be starting the site plan uh, administrative process with the county um, outside of what's already been worked on on the reverse of the control side of VDOT. Um, I would expect we would do that uh, late summer um, with the hope that we could start construction by the end of the year. Um, but that's just pending any sort of delays that could come. Uh, we still have a review at the state level for these amendments if, if all that passes in. Um, and our original expectation is that the permit would have to, we would have to be under construction um, by the end of the the permit time frame, not just submitted to the county. But the other what is the definition of under construction? I mean, I'm not splitting hairs here, but what we where you think you have to be if you, if you don't get it? We define under very sorry. I'm going to get them to stop and we're going to correct this in just a moment.
Welcome to the conference call. We will now connect you to your call. Please say your name. Auditory. Everyone, um, they've taken a five minute recess. If you would like to get up, use your restroom, whatever, you may take that time. Um,
Just wanted to let everyone know uh, they are returning from recess and they will begin uh, or resume the meeting shortly.
now open the public hearing for change of conditions on utility scale win for Fraley and Rocky Ford wind LLC. Uh, before making your comments, please state your name and address and uh, first comments will be heard from here at Greenfield. Remember the three minute time limit. Uh, and first one up in Greenfield, if you would approach the podium. This is Eric Clunch. I just wanted to let you know that we had a power failure or a, uh, an uh, IT problem in here, and we never heard the answer to one of the questions. So I want to re-ask the question, what is the definition of the start of construction? I'd like to hear the answer again. Thank you. I didn't hear that question. Mr. Terminator, Mr. Terminator has, but, yeah, it, it actually, the boots on the ground was his comment. So, that would be, uh, if, if I remember, I'm trying to get some backlash, back so everybody can hear it. Is there another speaker tonight? No, sir, there does not appear to be any other speakers. Thank you very much. Is there anybody on the line who would like to speak to this? If you would like to provide some comments, please press my asterisk by star on your phone so we can only meet you. Go ahead, call. Is there a caller there? Hey, you can hear me? Yes, yes. Hey, sorry, the system's a little confusing. You should probably try a different uh, conference call uh, provider. Um, when we do this again. But hey, um, so I made comments earlier. This is John Scarborough again, 532 Locust Bottom. Um, I'm kind of curious of what uh, what questions were asked when, when the phone was on mute? What, what were you talking about with uh, the Apex representative? And then number two, um, so I keep, I, you know, it was gonna be 25 turbines and now it was 22. And then as I sit here and listen, it's 13 to 18. Um, it doesn't really sound like Apex has, really has a clear plan on what they wanna do. Um, they're just waving money at you guys and, uh, looking for an approval. So 
So uh, I'm not exactly sure what, what's going on with that, but uh, I'm interested to know the answer. So, so exactly what were you guys talking about when we couldn't hear you? Well, we, we did, we took a five minute restroom break and <laughs> while they were doing some technical work to make sure that the uh, sound was coming in to all the different offices that were spread out in. I got here. So did I misunderstand? Did I misunderstand? I thought I heard someone say that you were asking Charlie questions while you were on break. No, that's not the. Okay, I'm, I guess I misunderstood. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, well, that's all I got. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Anyone else there? We have one more call. Calling the video on YouTube. Please proceed. Hello? Hello, caller. Would you state your name and address? Jeff Scott, 1026 Smoky Road, Lexington. Go ahead. Alright, one of the claims made by Apex to justify the destruction of the top of North Mountain is that Rocky Ford will produce enough energy to power up to 20,000 homes. In the 2019 Statement of Intent, in the Wind Study section on page 4, the following statement is made. The evaluation of wind data collected to date has demonstrated that the average wind speed is between 13.2 and 18.5 miles per hour to 125 meter hub height. This average wind speed is considered a strong wind resource in Virginia. There are at least three problems with this statement. One, an average is not a range of values, it is a single value. What is written is like saying a batting average is between 256 and 325. It's the meaning of the statement. Two, the statement is misleading in that it implies that wind is blowing all the time. The reality is that those are the most common speeds of the wind when it is blowing. Three, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory has a lot of research into the factors that determine the amount of electricity that a wind turbine can generate at different speeds. And they have a chart. I have an attachment in, a, in the comment I submitted. It shows resource potential at various wind speeds. The chart shows the wind speed of 13.2, which is the real number quoted, has a low potential. And the speed of 18 and a half miles per hour is the higher number provided, has an excellent potential. That's, that's quite a wide range. So you really need to know the distribution of those speeds. That is how often does a particular speed occur in order to determine the potential for generating electricity. And typically, the distribution will show that lower speed winds are more frequent than higher speeds. So to claim there is a strong wind resource seems to be a distortion of the fact. Beyond the problem with that statement, APEX neglected to mention significant factors that determine the amount of energy a turbine can generate at a specific speed, and that factor is turbulence and tempering. Basically, a measure of how turbulent the wind is at a site. The more turbulent the wind, the less efficient the turbine is. There's no document that winds on a mountain ridge are much more turbulent than winds on the side of land. And it also can lead to uh, varying loads on the turbine, which causes them to wear out more quickly, and that can lead to higher failure rates and catastrophic failure resulting in fire or collapse of the turbine. Now, the real problem here is Apex has not made the wind data they collected available to the public calling it proprietary. Since when is the wind proprietary? They make claims about the amount of electricity that will be generated, but they refuse to provide the wind speed data for independent analysis. What are they hiding? The is not built a lucky force because you could not find a buyer for the paltry and intermittent electricity that it will generate. Not until the million in Virginia signed a renewable energy statement, and the million needed to have a component of that to be wind, did APEX get a buyer. And the amount of electricity that Rocky Forge will generate, he claims he's shown by megawatts, is a drop in the bucket less than 3% in comparison to the 2,600 megawatts that will be generated by the coastal Virginia offshore of this project. So someone did a great Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's time to go. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the line? Mr. Chairman, at this time I do not show sure anyone uh, Anything you want to see, people like some comments. All done? Yes, correct. Okay. All right. We will uh, close the public hearing and discuss all the information that we have before us, uh, keeping in mind that we will address. Uh, the earlier
proposals on text amendment first and then move to the uh, uh, change that has been requested by ASEX for the uh, uh, construct for the special text. Why don't we go back and uh, begin with the uh, text minute. Any, any uh, thoughts since hearing uh, the presentations uh, that you've heard? Mr. Chairman, I move to the text amendments to chapter 25, section 446, wind energy systems as attached to the report prepared by staff of the following changes before it did more supervised. All of the uh, uh, conditions, which are 16 at this point in time, add one other additional condition that we must have an approved site approval within one year. Uh, Mr. Kidd wanted to address the three in proposed text amendments one at a time. So I guess that's going to be the turbine one. Would be the first one. The second one is going to be for the equipment and structure, the substations, facilities, and food tower. And then the other is to delete the five-year time limit. But us begin with first one. Middle uh, night. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I forget there's two. <laughs> <laughs> it it would be it would be okay with me to wrap those back up if we can do something with the, the special exception um, time option. I mean, we can wrap all of those back together or we can do it separately either one. I think we could uh, do them all together if uh, we come to some agreement on what that should be on that solution. Would it be acceptable to say that recommend denying the uh, deleting the five year time? I think that would be appropriate. Any comment before you? I agree. Mr. Nicely, Mr. B. Nicely, I understand the, the motion is for the secretary figuring it into the record. You're uh, recommending or making a motion that the text amendment to go forward as staff recommended for the height and the interconnection, and then you are recommending that the five year operational timeline remain within the text amendment and not be removed. No, I'm thinking I'm um, saying to uh, remove the expiration. Okay, so, so you are making a motion that it would go forward as recommended by staff and you're going to make another motion that deals with the time limit with the expiration of the SEP, it was an additional condition in the next motion. Is that, does that wrap it up? That's correct. It would be an additional uh, condition. Okay. Good. And basically deny the five year time limit of eliminating it from the code. Is there 
So if you took that out, then somewhere in the future, if someone else wanted to put up towers, the five-year timeline would not be there. Is that correct? No, it would still be there. We're just, still be there. We're, just, we're just taking it out of uh, this change. So, if I might add a point of clarification, if you leave it in there, then there is still an operate, there's an expectation that the, that the operation of the wind, wind farm must be operational within five years of the granting of the special exception permit. That is the way the text amendment is currently written. That's the way the, the code is currently written today. So the five year timeline, if you do not delete that section of the ordinance, would still apply. If you delete that section of the ordinance as recommended by staff and then add a condition to the SVP, you may deal with the, special, with the expiration of the SVP through the condition and not have a perceived conflict. Nicole, if I may clarify as well. Thank you. Correct me if I'm wrong. Currently, there's a specific provision in the code at the five year limit for. Um, these systems. There's a general um, code provision for period validity in the code that provides that you can change the time limit. So if you delete the specific one from this one, you go to the general one which provides that you can provide shorter time frames or longer time frames as, as necessary. That makes it just a little confusing because we're deleting. Um, but deleting the five-year um, timeline does not remove, does not mean there is no timeline. It means it reverts to the uh, default, which now is a little more flexible. Is, is that right, Nicole? Yes, yeah, thank you. So, if you, so the section that staff is recommending deleting exists in the wind energy ordinance under 446. There's another section of the code that exists for all SVPs, which will allow you to impose a condition to reduce the timeline and, and make it shorter than five years. But in order to do that, you need to delete the section 446 so that 583D2 is applicable. I think that's, that's what we're trying to explain. Okay, that, uh, that is understood. Good. I think that clears it up. I bet your kids, does that clear that up with you? Yep. Okay. Now, Mr. Nice, can you state that motion? Please, <laughs> <laughs> I move that the text amendment chapter 25 section 4 be amended to the systems as attached to the report prepared, prepared by staff with the following change. Be forward to the board of supervisors with a recommendation of approval. And that includes the 16 staff recommendations of conditions and the one additional one for one year site approval. That, Mr. Nicely, I'm sorry, that would be a separate motion. So the first motion that needs to be taken specific to the text amendment only, and then another recommendation, another motion on special exception permit with the attached conditions. Two motions are required. Right. And we've got, and let's just move, I move the text amendments to chapter 25, 446, the energy attached, prepared by staff before the board of supervisors recommend, uh, recommendation of approval. This recommendation is made on the basis that the requirements of section 25, 581.1, the zoning ordinance have been satisfied that the proposal would serve the public necessity, convenience, general welfare, and the condition of zoning practice. Is that it? That does. Is there a second to that? Second. Further discussion? Questions? Roll call, please. Mr. Howell, welcome, please. Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Mr. Kidd? Yes. Mr. Thurman? Yes. Mr. Brandon Nicely? Yes. Thank you.
All right, now the question before you is on the uh, on C, request to change the conditions to the previously approved special exception permit. You have the uh, report from the uh, third party and the report by Mr. Johnson and the input from the public uh, in each of the, uh, the cases as we've heard from the city club those that have been sent in earlier uh, to staff.